Hi, I wanted to uh, review some of the material from um, October 10th uh, and 8th um, this week, and then also give a quick introduction to some of the stuff that's coming up with ADHD next week. Um, the introduction will be at the end, but the homework that's due on Monday does not have any questions about that. The homework's just focused on material we've already talked about. So um, we talked about, um, uh, continue to talk a little bit about um, addiction, and um, in particular, um, we talked about compensation. And um, one point that I wanted to reiterate about compensation um, is that the compensation is not completely perfect. That is to say, um, if you are consuming enough caffeine that 50% of your adenosine receptors are blocked, then your neurons are not going to respond by putting twice as many adenosine receptors in. If they did that, then that would completely negate the effects of the caffeine, and then you would only be experiencing withdrawal and no stimulus effects when you drink caffeine. Um, in fact, what happens is um, if you're consuming enough caffeine to have, to, to have half your receptors blocked, maybe an extra 20% of receptors go in. So that means that still there's more adenosine signaling after the compensation than before. Um, part of the effects of the caffeine have gone away. And when the adenosine, when the caffeine goes away, then the signal is bigger than it was, but it is only a partial compensation. Um, also, decreasing dose or discontinuing um, while they cause withdrawal, and withdrawal can be both unpleasant and even dangerous for some drugs, um, the decreasing dose um, will lead to a reversal where now um, the receptors, the extra receptors that were put in to compensate for an antagonist will be slowly removed, or the receptors that are removed to compensate for an agonist will be slowly put back in. Um, so these are reversible processes. Um, also, adenosine, we discussed in some detail, um, adenosine has a sort of very unusual way in which it, in, in which it behaves. Um, we've already talked about a little bit before how a lot of glutamate-releasing neurons also put ATP into the vesicles, and then these vesicles respond, um, not only then activate glutamate receptors that, that let sodium in, but they also activate purine receptors, ATP receptors on the postsynaptic dendrites, um, and these ATP receptors turn on G-stimulatory responses. Um, but it turns out that the ATP is not sucked back into the neur neuron the way that other neurotransmitters are. Instead, the ATP will, over the period of uh, a few minutes to a couple of hours, um, spontaneously break down into eventually um, adenosine and then some free-floating phosphates. And it turns out that this adenosine does not um, uh, does not um, sorry, um, that this adenosine does not get re taken back into neurons either. Um, instead, what happens is that the adenosine um, will stay in the cerebral spinal fluid. The concentration builds up over the course of a day, and then when you're unconscious, the, cere the, the cerebral spinal fluid circulation increases. The adenosine gets removed from the cerebral spinal fluid, put back into the blood, and then other cells elsewhere in the body can take it up out of the blood. Um, but that is why until you're asleep, the adenosine levels build up. And then the adenosine, um, just floating around in the cerebral spinal fluid, builds up to a higher and higher concentration and starts activating adenosine receptors all over many neurons. And these are GI, inhibitory coupled receptors. And so it makes it so that neurons generally are inhibited and have it's harder for neurons to fire action potentials over the course of the day. And that manifests as feeling tired. Caffeine, by blocking that, will, of course, prevent you from feeling tired. Um, we also talked a little bit about the striatum. Um, uh, an interesting feature of the striatum that um, uh, is not something that we need to worry about just yet, although it is somewhat relevant for, for Parkinson's, for Tourette's syndrome, um, is that uh, the striatum becomes active, especially in starting and stopping a disease, uh, an action. Um, this is going to come up again with Parkinson's as well, but this is why excess dopamine in the striatum can lead to urges to initiate movements. Um, the cerebellum, on the other hand, is what sort of gets uh, activated during an action um, that you're performing. Um, importantly, though, dopamine in the striatum increases urges to move.
Um, we also then discussed um, how, in general, one goes about um, figuring out whether two diseases have a common genetic mechanism. There are a few, po so actually there's four possibilities um, it could happen. Um, one possibility is that the genes, is that there's no commonality at all between the diseases. Um, and this is the case, for example, with, um, uh, with major depressive disorder and, um, uh, and um, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, there's not um, really any common genetic risk factors or interactions between the disease or increased comorbidity. Um, some people do have both, um, but the risk of having one doesn't depend on whether or not you have the other and so on and so forth. Um, so there might be no correlation, just two separate sets of genetic risk factors. Um, but if we know that diseases tend to be comorbid, then, um, the, um, then there are a few possible ways that that could happen. One is that um, the genes, there's one set of genes that cause risk for one disease and a separate set of genes that cause risk for the other, but the first disease, once it manifests, can cause risk of the second um, or vice versa. Um, and then the last possibility is that maybe there's a single set of genes um, that give rise to a risk of both and that can manifest again either as one or the other or both. Um, and so we talked about one study that looked at this, um, the PALS study. Um, and in the PALS study, they had they had um, actually a couple different sets of data, but the most interesting one is when they have probands, um, the research subjects that they began with, who had Tourette's without OCD. And then what um, we talked through quite a bit what the possible results would be um, in terms of these different genetic bases, and you should review that. Um, and the reasoning why that is the case. Um, but the ultimate result is that the, um, if you have probands with you have Tourette's without OCD, then we see an increase in the relatives with Tourette's, increase in the relatives with OCD, including increased rates of OCD without Tourette's syndrome. And so what that tells us is that um, we're in the, 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 the third possibility that um, that there are um, increased risk of, uh, uh, that, that, that there's a common genetic risk basis for Tourette's and OCD um, that can manifest in different ways. Um, we also discussed um, alternate methods that are not well designed, and there is a homework question about this. Um, if you start with probands that have Tourette's plus OCD, um, then, the, then you would expect that relatives would have an increased risk of Tourette's an increased risk of OCD and an increased risk of both. And that's even true in the one other model that we didn't discuss in class, which is if maybe those traits have absolutely nothing to do with each other and there's no increased comorbidity in the first place, and with no increased comorbidity in the first place, um, uh, if you start with unlucky probands who happen to have two diseases, then you're going to find um, uh, an increased risk of um, of uh, both of these um, diseases. Sorry, I've got some reminders coming up that I can ignore for the time being. Okay, um, next from today, um, we talked about a variety of different things. One thing is that we talked about um, how glutamate from the cortex can either, glutamate is always excitatory for neurons, but some of the neurons in the basal ganglia um, suppress movement. Um, so glutamate might turn on a neuron which suppresses movement, um, or glutamate might turn on a neuron that enhances movement. Um, what dopamine does, though, dopamine has sort of an interesting function. Dopamine into the striatum will specifically turn up the activity of the neurons that are designed to enhance movement and specifically turn down the activity by binding to different receptors on the neurons that suppress movement. Um, and so what that means is that dopamine always promotes movement. Um, you should be definitely clear on that. There's a homework question about that in the context of D2 receptors, and it would be a lot of fun to write an exam question in the context of D1 receptors. That's very much like the homework question. Um, we, um, in the context of this, um, we talked, well, so we talked about, uh, of course, Tourette's syndrome, symptoms, um, tics, and so on, urges to move. And then we talked about, as well, um, Tourette's treatments. One treatment is D2 antagonists, which directly suppress movement urges by turning down the inhibition of the stop neuron, so you have more 
stop neuron signal coming out. Um, but we also um, have um, uh, we also have um, other the the downside of this is because um, the the um, functions of dopamine are not just movement but also pleasure and attention and cognition. If you have um, uh, drugs that block dopamine, then you are going to have decreased pleasure and decreased attention and concentration. Um, and so the, um, uh, the antipsychotic drugs, because of the, the strong risk of side effects, are usually seen as a second line of defense. Um, the, the less effective, on average, less likely to be effective, um, but much less likely to also have negative side effects, is um, alpha to adrenergic receptor agonists. Um, so we're going to be returning to this when we talk about ADHD, but there are three types of adrenergic or norepinephrine or noradrenaline receptors. Of course, everything has a lot of names. Um, one is the alpha-1 receptors. Um, these have these are coupled to something that we haven't talked about before called GQ-associated G proteins. Um, and these GQ proteins do not excite or inhibit cells, but instead have very complicated effects that change gene expression, other neurotransmitter um, receptors, and metabolism. Um, we will be talking about some of the effects of these GQ receptors on the organism, even though we're not going to go into the cell biology um, in this class. Um, but... Um, uh, and then also, as another side, there are beta receptors. These are G-stimulatory. These are also involved in the sympathetic nervous system, the fight-or-flight response. Um, but for Tourette syndrome, what we're interested in is the alpha-2, which are inhibitory receptors. And so agonists that turn this up have a calming effect and can generally help to sort of calm some of the symptoms, uh, help patients to manage some of the tics associated with um, Tourette syndrome. Um, so... Um, Again, we sort of uh, yeah, recapped um, Tourette's uh, uh, probands, but then we also talked about a different comorbidity, Tourette's syndrome with depression. And in this case, um, uh, we didn't talk about the specific studies because there's actually a variety of them that sort of led to this. Um, but if you have people with Tourette's and not depression, and then you look at the relatives, what you'll find is an increased risk of Tourette's among the relatives no change in the risk of depression relative to controls, but an increased frequency of Tourette's plus depression. And so what that indicates is that some people get depression from depression-specific risk factors. Other people might have genes that put them at risk for Tourette's, then they develop Tourette's, and then Tourette's itself somehow carries with it an increased risk of depression. And the reason is thought to be because Tourette's um, Living with Tourette's, as with many other mental illnesses, um, and or really any illnesses at all, um, uh, do carry risk of depression because living with illness can be stressful um, for a variety of reasons. Tourette's, um, in particular, can cause people to be more likely to be teased as a child, which is, you know, can be stressful and does ha carry with it um, an increase in risk in, of depression. Um, we then talked about histamine. And histamine has a lot of interesting complexity to it. H1 type histamine receptors are what is involved in the immune system. And these receptors um, tend to be sort of stimulatory kinds of receptors. Um, and in the immune system, um, histamine will turn on and activate immune cells when it binds to H1 receptors. There are also H1 receptors in the brain stem. These H1 receptors in the brain stem are known to be involved, uh, also sort of turn up neuron activity in the brain stem and promote wakefulness. This is why Benadryl, which is a selective antagonist for H1 receptors, so it doesn't block H2 or H3 receptors, but it does block H1 receptors, or at least it pretty efficiently blocks them, um, makes you sleepy as well as helping prevent itchiness and bug bites and things. Um, but we're real really sort of getting interested in histamine in the context of Tourette's is that a very small fraction of people with Tourette's have a mutation where they have one of the two, one of the 
most people have two functional copies of the gene that encodes the enzyme to make histamine. Um, but one in 10,000 people are, have one broken copy of that gene. And every one of those people who has one broken copy develops Tourette's syndrome. Um, the presentation is no different from, uh, uh, from people who have Tourette's from other uh, sources. Um, and what happens is histamine from the tuber mammillary nucleus makes these synapses onto the axon terminals of the dopamine releasing neurons from the substantia nigra and has not H1 but H2 and H3 inhibitory receptors there. And so just like um, sort of similar to how we saw um, morphine can suppress the release of neurotransmitter, here histamine suppresses the release of dopamine in the striatum. And so since dopamine increases the urge to move, histamine in every one of us who doesn't have this rare genetic condition is constantly helping to keep our dopamine levels from getting too high and suppressing our urges to move. Um, so, um, interestingly, even though these patients produce half as much histamine, their wakefulness function of histamine and their allergic reaction and immune functions of histamine are not effective. And the reason gets into something called receptor affinity which is that our H1 receptors, these are like the Beyonce receptors that get swarmed no matter how much histamine is there. Our H1 receptors have a very high affinity for histamine. What that means is even if you cut the amount of histamine in half, those H1 receptors still, when histamine is released, they're still going to get totally activated. The, um, another way to say that is if you double the amount of histamine, they don't notice the excess because they're already totally covered. Um, and if you cut it in half, they don't notice that, the, that it's been cut away because they're so sticky that they still get totally covered, even with half as much histamine. They still get totally fully activated, even when there's half as much histamine in that. Um, however, the H2 and H3 receptors, those inhibitory receptors on the presynaptic terminal, have lower affinities. And so what that means is that if we cut the amount of histamine in half, then they do notice that. They are no longer as activated. Um, and so, um, and so um, that means that people who have half as much histamine produced have less of this um, suppression of dopamine, so more dopamine, so more urges to move, and that's what gives rise to the tics. Um, but in terms of the H1 wakefulness and the H1 immune function, no difference because half as much histamine doesn't matter for those H1 receptors. They're always going to be activated. I think that covers most of the main topics. Um, in terms of ADHD, just a quick preview of some of the stuff for ADHD for next time. Um, we are going to um, <clears throat> be talking again about dopamine and some of the functions of dopamine and some of the, the dopamine and norepinephrine um, uh, uh, synthesis pathways and so on in, um, in ADHD for next time. Um, but um, one thing with ADHD that I did want to sort of give a brief introduction to is that when ADHD is uh, uh, diagnosed, there are two main classes of symptoms. There are symptoms of inattentiveness and other symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity. And depending on which set of symptoms a person exhibits, um, there are three types of ADHD that they might have. They might have inattentive type, if their ADHD is characterized primarily by inattentive symptoms. They might have hyperactive slash impulsive type if their ADHD is characterized primarily by hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. Or some people happen to have um, both sets of symptoms. And so they uh, have a diagnosis of combined type, um, which means, just means that they fit the di diagnostic criteria for both of those. Um, we'll talk about that and also the, the norepinephrine and dopamine signaling more next class period.